Good afternoon and welcome to the first of what we hope will be ongoing conversations about race and racism in America and specifically in Baltimore County Public Schools. My name is Michael Dickerson. I'm the Chief of Staff for Team BCPS. Today, we will hear from students, employees, community members, and stakeholders from all over the county. They will tackle difficult conversations, but they are discussions our students indicate are long overdue and they now demand. By now, we have all seen the pictures, videos, and stories of demonstrations and peaceful protests following the recent killings of black men and women in cities and towns all around the country. Of course, we all remember the outrage and outcry that happened here in our, in our own region following the death of Freddie Gray in Baltimore City. The conversations that follow these incidents always come back to the question of institutional racism in our government agencies, in our local, state, and federal laws, and yes, in our school systems. That brings us to the reason for today's conversation and program. How has race impacted the education received by students in Baltimore County Public Schools? Historically, what have we done about it? And most importantly, now that we have called it out, what will we do to correct it? We will get to those questions throughout the program, but first, to answer the question of why this conversation is so important now, and to lay out the equity work and training the system is currently undergoing, I have the honor of introducing our superintendent of schools, Dr. Daryl Williams. Dr. Williams, thanks for supporting this uh, effort and, and supporting the kids. So thank you, Mr. Dickerson, and good afternoon and welcome to everyone. Last month, I reached out to our community of families and staff with a letter requesting that we all take the time to have honest conversations about racism and its impact on education. Today's event is just one part of that action. As a Black father and educator, I think about race every day, and I know my own family thinks about it as well. I also think about our students and how our actions now contribute to their future. This is one of many times when we need to take our cues from our students. They are ready to talk about race and we must be ready to talk about change. Our academic performance data demonstrate clear trends. Our gaps in performance have been persistent over many years and are primarily based on race. Add to that the disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on the health and wealth of Black and Latinx community members as just the latest example of how racism harms all of us. And we are extremely diverse as a county. Almost two thirds of our students are now students of color. Our schools welcome families with more than a hundred countries where they're coming from. To honor the brilliance of every student, we need to acknowledge the effect of race on our schools and make decisions that, as I've said many times, raise the academic bar, close the gaps, and prepare our young people for, for vibrant futures. As your superintendent, I'm committed to equity work in, in, in BCPS, and I'm proud that our board has adopted one of few equity policies in the nation. I am proud of our equity leadership trainings and school-based equity teams. My own cabinet of senior leaders has engaged in ongoing conversations about equity. And today, we'll talk about what's next. Your experience today may range from discomfort, agreement, and disagreement. I hope you have questions. Know that we will not resolve them all today. All I ask is that you stay engaged. Our students are too important not to. Thank you, Dr. Williams, and we'll obviously hear from you throughout the program today. But let's get to today's conversation. We told you the event was inspired by our own students. Before we lay out the format for today's conversation, we want to check in with our Instagram Live co-host, uh, former member Omar Rashid and current member Josh Mahamza. They've been hosting a, a series of questions and students over on Instagram Live, and we'll ask that one of them come over and give us a little bit of what they've heard already from the students uh, taking part in that format. Okay, hey Michael, can you hear me? I can. Yeah, so we just uh, had an interesting conversation with a uh, former uh, student member of the board, um, Halima Adekoya. Um, turn the camera on. Uh, sorry about that, uh, let me turn the camera on. 
Okay, can you see me? We um, got you. So we at the Instagram live right now, and um, while guys we're talking to the actual event, so say uh, hello to Instagram live, Michael. How's everyone over there, students? Thank you for inspiring us to have this conversation. Thank you, Michael. Um, so a few, we can't really hear you, but I'll just uh, tell you what's happening. Right now. Okay. Um, so um, in Halima's conversation, uh, she talked about um, ways to uh, talk to people who don't want to so, listen to this, uh, have this conversation on race. Um, she talked about her experiences and wanting to um, see more people uh, who look like her um, in the school, in the school system, um, learning about African American history. Um, getting to, uh, sorry, uh, what else she mentioned? Um, and she mainly talked about her work on uh, promoting being anti-racist and being anti-racist and et cetera. So um, we haven't had that many conversations with students, but this conversation with Halima was pretty great. Josh, we'll be checking in with you guys throughout the program and, and thank you, especially, you've hit the ground running as the new member, a student member of the board. So welcome to you and, and thanks again for today. Yeah, and Mike, I just want to uh, thank you guys for hosting this event. It's really important, and uh, as a student, and getting to see our school system take this initiative is just pretty great. And thank you, uh, Dr. Williams. I got to see a little bit of your speech, but yeah, thank you. Thanks a lot, Josh. We'll check back in later. Folks, the format for today's program includes panel discussions and powerful videos. We will go back and forth to Instagram Live as well. Today's panels will be facilitated by Dr. Lisa Williams, our Executive Director for Equity and Cultural Profi Proficiency. Uh, as you know, Lisa has done incredible work around race discussions and equity in Team BCPS. But before we hear from her, let's hear from someone who can provide some context and give history to the discussion we're having today. Well, when I became superintendent, uh, we had a superintendent staff, executive staff of 12 people, and one was female. Uh, when I left, it was about 50-50. Uh, and uh, we had one African-American, and this too was getting close to 50-50 uh, when I finished in uh, Good afternoon, everyone. I am Lisa Williams, Executive Director in the Office of Equity and Cultural Proficiency, and I will be moderating panels, the panels that we're going to have. So let me give a bit of context. In 1903, Dr. W.E.B. Du Bois wrote the American classic, The Souls of Black Folk where he stated the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line. Problematizing race through stigmatizing color, then creating laws, institutions, and cultural mores around the degraded positioning of both blackness and non-whiteness has created turmoil in American life, both historically as well as in this current moment. The coronavirus is disproportionately impacting Black, Afro, Latinx, and Indigenous communities. The killings of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, has literally sparked months of protests around the world. It is with this backdrop that we create space to both name and own the work of dismantling structural racism in Baltimore County Public Schools. We need to examine the idea that if any of us is in peril, all of us are in peril. So yes, black lives matter. Further, black trans lives matter. And we need to deal with why the work of treating all people with dignity and ensuring access to opportunity is such a challenging contemplation in a country whose her story, their story, his story is rooted in the constant striving for freedom. So according to the Aspen Institute, structural racism is defined as a system in which public policies, institutional practices, cultural representations, and other norms work in various ways, often reinforcing themselves to perpetuate racial group inequity. 
We know through the work of scholars like Kim Crenshaw, these issues are complex as systems of oppression overlap and intertwine. But this public conversation is our continued effort to do the hard work of dismantling such systems and creating access to opportunities. So our first panel is designed to really talk about the history of one well, of the recent history of issues of both race and racism in the Baltimore County public school context. So I'd like to invite each of the panelists to um, unmute and certainly share, um, enable your camera and talk a little bit about your experience, the longevity that you've had in the organization. Um, can you talk about how you experienced race professionally? And what I mean by that is, how did you see race function, particularly in the beginning of your career? Um, and how do you merge that, those um, observations with present day issues and challenges? And don't forget to introduce yourself. Good afternoon, Lisa. This is Billy Burke, the Chief of Organizational Effectiveness. Uh, I have a few comments I'll make uh, about my experiences. This is my 28th year in Baltimore County Public Schools. I started out as a first and second grade teacher at Wellwood International in 1993. And what I would tell you about my experiences is that I, I never contemplated race, uh, certainly not my own. Um, I didn't understand that uh, my whiteness, uh, being, being a, a white man, had any effect on how I existed within the organization. And how that translated to the larger conversation was really, we didn't talk about race. Uh, it was unspoken, but there was no forum for having discussions around race within the organization. And it was almost a matter of pride to say things like, I don't see race. And so when I, when you ask me to reflect on the difference now, what I've learned in, in reading and doing equity training is when I don't, when I say that I don't see race, it dishonors all my black and brown brothers and sisters within the organization. Of course, when I see you walk into a room, I recognize immediately that you're a black woman. And so to say, I don't see race um, nullifies the culture and experience as a black woman that you bring into, into the room. And so what I've learned is when I do that, I um, take away the voice of people and their culture and their experience and ignore the fact that they have different lived experiences than I do. And because of that, I'm unable to see how I need to change how I provide instruction, how I provide guidance, how I provide leadership. And so for me, this equity experience, this equity training has really been an awakening over time of how we need to rethink how we live, act, and make decisions in the organization in order to honor the experiences of people of color. Thank you. Um, Ms. King, Ms. Stokes, would either of you like to share? Sure, this is Yasmin. Um, are you able to hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, great. Okay, so um, I preference by saying that uh, I started my career in Baltimore City at a facility as a diagnostic and prescriptive teacher. Um, and I worked with level five and six students, uh, special needs students. Um, and so for those who aren't aware of level five and six, level five meant self-contained and level six uh, were institutionalized students. Um, and I thought it was important that I preference that I spent the first eight years in Baltimore City. So when I uh, joined Baltimore County Public Schools in October of 1986, 34 years ago, I recognized right away that the demographics were vastly different. Um, I was one among uh, three African-American teachers and one left uh, the following year, so it was two of us, um, out of a staff of about 75. 
um, teachers. So the first thing I noticed was that I was hyper-visible in the building. Um, I was often stopped in the hall uh, to ask if I was a parent, if I was lost. I was even asked at one point if I was in the right building. Um, many people were curious. Some were inviting. The second thing I noticed um, was the availability of an abundance of resources, at least my perception was that. Yet I heard so many complaints about what they didn't have, and so quickly I picked up on that sense of entitlement. Um, the third, and I think the most um, discomforting thing that I noticed um, in 1986 was how race played out towards the few students of color specifically uh, black and brown boys. Um, and I can recall one incident that stays with me um, where there was a, a biracial student in second grade. He was my student. Um, and we were doing uh, some information around Martin Luther King Jr. And one of the white students said to him, you're black like Martin Luther King. The little boy became upset and said, no, I'm not. And he asked me if I thought he was black. And I said, that's a conversation you need to have with your mom. So later, I did contact the mom. I shared the incident. But later, I approached a first grade teacher who was a white female. And I said to her, um, I, you know, this situation happened in class where the student questioned whether he's black or not. And she said, oh, yeah, it happened with me last year, and I told him, you're either black or you're dirty. And then the second thing happened, a teacher uh, was cleaning out her closet and gave me uh, some puzzles for my students, and one of the puzzles was Little Black Sambo. So I knew I was sitting in something that I had to um, – make a difference, kind of bring that to attention that there are some issues centering around race. I did speak with the principal, and I said, I think we need to, you know, back in the day it was called diversity training. Needed to, um, and I did have conversations with both of those teachers, like, do you understand what you're saying um, and what you're doing? What's the historical context behind Little Black Sambo and then calling a black student dirty? Um, and so I knew then that some things needed to happen in Baltimore County. Thanks for your truth. Um, and it's so important that as you are hearing this conversation and you are considering what's being shared, to ask yourself really critical questions about what is the present day experience that brings us to this moment? And do we find resonance in even things that happened 30 years ago? So. Here's a question for both um, Billy and Yasmin. And again, if Ms. King is on, feel free to just jump right in. My wondering is, as you reflect over your careers in Baltimore County, I know that a huge part of the historical framework has been around the amount of um, segregation that has historically been a part of the way that we could even characterize the faculty, right? So uh, Dr. Dubell was talking about um, how few folks of color were a part of his administrative team. Uh, we know that there were issues with gender and gender representation in terms of staffing. So as you reflect on your experience in the organization and you think through the intellect, intersectional lenses of race and gender, what's been your experience around just the question of staffing diversity that you would want to elevate? So Lisa, I'll jump in. You know, I oversee teacher development within the organization and assist HR in recruitment strategies. And, uh, you know, it is a struggle right now. Uh, there certainly is a plan in place to hire staff to mirror the ethnic and racial um, demographics of the student body. Uh, we believe that's important, but it's it's been a really hard task. Um, there are lots of different strategies that we've tried, but uh, the needle hasn't moved much. Uh, we remain very um, racially segregated in terms of staff, 
Certainly we have uh, way more uh, white teachers within the system than we do black teachers. Uh, and our recruitment efforts, even though we've tried, haven't been as strong as they need to be. So we consider, uh, we continue to consider out of the box thinking around how we do recruit and what those plans need to look like. Uh, I, know, I know I hear communities and students asking for that as well. They want uh, teacher representation to match the demographics of the students. Um, we, have, we have work to do around that. Uh, that, that that's, those would be my comments. Yeah. Yasmin, is there anything you would want to uplift about your experience as a black woman thinking about the diversity of staffing over the course of your tenure? Thanks, Billy. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one of the things that concerned me gravely, and I know with 40 some years in education, I see um, that we are lacking in the hiring of black teachers, but I'm equally concerned about what is happening uh, to our black administrators. And one of the things in terms of the recruitment piece, my personal experience was that I had to be responsible for recruiting black teachers or teachers of color, mostly black, into my uh, all Title I schools. So what I, what I noticed is that, you know, as a principal, as assistant principal, we often worked with HR um, to look for recruitment, but it looked very different with our HBCU recruit versus how we recruited at Towson and Loyola and other colleges. And so I think we have to sit with that thought that we have to do something different in our partnering, our HBCUs, and not exclusive to Maryland HBCUs, but really looking at the Delmarva um, area where we recruit. And I just had to go on the campus and find a lot of my own teachers because um, I saw things happening with, with how we were looking for um, teachers and how teachers are interviewed and how teachers are placed on a rating scale. And so it looked different based on teachers, black teachers versus how white teachers were um, recruited and rated by certain panels. And so I just have to be honest and speak my truth, what I observed happening. So I went to Coppin and I went to Morgan and I networked other teachers of color, kind of color, so that my students of color would, black and brown students, people in the building that looked like them and not just one or two. My goal was to have a grade. It was a lot of work um, to make those things happen. And so changes really do need to take place around them. Thank you both. And so I want to throw it over to Omar and Josh. But before we do that, here is my wondering for you uh, two panelists. If Black Lives Matter, then does Black staffing matter? And if Black staffing matters and other staff of color, right, as we think about the diversity of our students, what thoughts would you offer about why this issue is so critically important? Why do, why does Black staff matter? So Lisa, I think it speaks to what Yasmin was talking about in terms of gatekeeping. Um, if, if it's true that panelists have implicit bias when they interview candidates of color and that shows up in who gets passed through to the next level, um, that's, that's how we start to attack that idea that black lives matter, black staffing matters. That we, we figure out, we, we examine those biases and we figure out how to mitigate them. And when we're aware of them, then we train people in terms of those interview panels to think and, and listen and move uh, differently in terms of how they interact with the people that they interview. So um, I think you, you raise a great point. 
if we believe Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter, then we have to believe staffing matters and Black administrators matter. How they're chosen, how they're trained, how they're put, how they're interviewed, all that has to be examined because our implicit biases show up, and that's where uh, racial racial in, um, institutional racism starts to gain a foothold within the organization. Thanks. Yes, any closing thoughts before we go back to our students? Um, so I, I agree with Billy, and I, I think it's in, um, that we, we really spend time looking at how, how are we being culturally responsive to our students if we don't know our students. And so it's important that they do have um, representation of a that look like them and possibly live like them and can really um, bring all teachers, regardless of color and gender, together. And we really do at the elementary look closer at um, how we bring males to um, the schools as well. Thank you. Michael, sending it over to you. Thanks a lot, Lisa. We're going to check back in with Josh and Omar. I want to take care of a couple of things really quick, though. We know you're sending in questions through the chat, and we will definitely try to take a question or two here and there during the panel. Also, we've had a couple of people who have talked about Omar and Josh being so close together and not social distancing. You are correct, but I will tell you that Omar and Josh have been together for weeks. They've, they've uh, made it a pact to um, make sure they're both being careful social distancing when they're not together, but they they've been together for a couple of weeks So th in terms of that, they're okay, but we are very cognizant of the fact that um, We should all be social distancing with that I'll go over to Josh and Josh share with us some of what you've been talking about over on Instagram live But also Josh can you how many? Uh, black and or teachers of color have you had since you've been in the school system? Um, my, honestly, Michael, it's not a lot. I can't even I don't even think it's more than five um, in my high school career. But uh, before I uh, continue on that conversation, I, I would like to add that, yes, me and Omar uh, have been uh, together for weeks, and the pe there's not that many people in here, and everybody had ma We actually have our masks on, so don't worry. We have our masks on. It's really important. So, yeah, um, the diversity with teachers is really important, especially for an African-American student. And if we don't have um, people who look like us, it might uh, affect how you perform in schools, and especially uh, low-income school students. So, yeah. Um, Josh, and before we switch to the next panel, I see you you all have a lot of activity over on Instagram Live. Some of the questions you're getting from students, some of the things you're responding to. Yeah, we talked to a student from Western, and she mentioned how her school uh, is a, a diverse school, and but still things like microaggressions uh, and stereotypes are present, and she had to overcome them throughout her high school career. And I, she gave us tips on how she did that, like. Um, confronting them, making sure that people know that uh, that's not uh, who she really is. And I was just wondering, do you mind giving tips on how have you become uh, stereotypes throughout your life as an adult? Me specifically? Yeah, as an adult. Just wondering. Yeah, yeah. Josh, thanks for the question. I didn't realize the mic was going to be turned on me, but I'm, I'm happy to yeah. answer the question. I mean, listen, you know, I think no matter where you go when you are born, particularly as a black male, um, you start to hear, see, and react and respond to things uh, that come your way that you notice don't happen to your white uh, counterparts. I grew up in an area where I was uh, always one of the only uh, blacks and typically the only black male. And so um, it got to a point, I'm sorry to say, that I, I, you become numb to it to a point. But trust me, my parents made sure I was very aware. So um, stereotypes would be something like when I was in Richmond, Virginia, um, I was uh, working on a TV in TV there, and I'd go to a store with my suit on after work. It didn't matter. I would be followed around stores when I was shopping. Um, people would watch or, or look at me. Um, and, and sometimes I'd say, well, maybe it's because they've seen me on TV. But a, a lot of times, you know it when you know it, and, and you try to explain it to people you know when people are watching you and for what reason. So stereotypes happen a lot. I mean, people just assume that you are going to do or act a certain way. I remember when I started applying for schools, uh, there were certain schools that 
everyone thought I would apply to, uh, that, that there's no way I would apply to um, schools that some of my white friends were applying to. So those types of, of stereotypes have always happened. And Josh, I'm, I'm sorry to say to you that it will continue through your adult life. Um, but how we show up and, uh, and express ourselves is important. You're well on your way to doing it the right way um, because speaking up and speaking out is important. And that's what I've been trying to do uh, for as long as I remember, can remember. But I had parents who demanded that of me. So thank you for that question. That's great, Michael. Um, and um, the other idea that we discussed uh, in our Instagram Live was um, the achievement gap and standardized testing and how like there's a lot of disparities with that. And um, this actually two uh, girls answered this, that um, sometimes uh, students of color and low income students sometimes face a difficulty uh, in school in order to like um, score a certain score that will get them to um, a college or uh, a program. And we hey, mainly discussed Lisa? that and achieve makeup was a big thing for them. Lisa. Um, what programs, Lisa? Um, how is, sorry, um, how has BCPS um, tried to uh, fix this issue this past couple of years? Can you Josh, somebody was uh, speaking in when you, when you uh, asked the question, I missed the first part. Will you ask that again? Yeah, um, I said uh, in our conversation with uh, two girls, they, we, they mentioned the achievement gap and uh, the disparity in standardized testing and how um, sometimes student of col students of color and low income students don't score as high. And those scores sometimes affect how they get into colleges, how they get into specialized programs. And we just we were just wondering, how does BCPS handle that? And Josh, Dr. Williams is here, and he's going to be talking about that uh, later, but but I think he'll chime in now. Doc, you want to take a shot at that one? So, sure. Uh, thanks for that question. You know, I think nowadays the colleges are looking beyond just a test score, and we have been talking as a system looking at multiple measures more than just a standardized test. And so a part of the work and the continued work will be helping our students. We have something called Project Graduation, and we're gonna continue that. It's a part of our strategic plan, but we wanna make sure our students have opportunities after high school and not to allow one exam to really paint their future. Colleges are looking at more of how involved students are, what courses they're taking, um, their future goals and aspirations, and we wanna help our students. I say this all the time. There's a college out there for any student. We just got to find the right match. And then once you get in, we want you to stay. We want you to, to finish. And sometimes there's the financial difficulties. And sometimes it may not be a right match. But I appreciate that, that point. When I was coming along, it was that SAT score. That would make or break you along with a GPA. Now colleges are looking for more well-rounded students to see what they're doing inside schools and as well as outside of schools. Doc, thank you for that. And Josh, we'll be coming back to you guys a bit later. We're gonna to start to transition to the panel too, but before we do, uh, once again, we'll try a video. We're having some technical difficulty with the videos, but we'll work through it. Let's see if we can get this one to uh, queue up for us. And then Lisa will come out on the other side and walk us through the next panel. Uh, that includes current employees, including teachers and principals. I could see from my front lawn the elementary school that was about five minutes away from where my house was. But because blacks and whites were separate by Jim Crow laws, I was bused out to Lorley, way out Philadelphia Road, to a two-room school with no running water. You'll typically see that um, African Americans, if there was an opportunity for them to attend the school, they were dealing with leftovers. The books that were, were outdated that the community's white school didn't want could then be used um, hand-me-downs, leftovers, I don't know what, what term you're, you're more familiar with, but nothing was new. It was not separate yet equal, and buildings that looked like barns when the schools that were the white schools were much more inviting. Brown versus Board comes in 1954. 
and Baltimore County desegregates schools in 1959. No training, no preparation, no classes, just put these two disparate groups together and then expect it to work. Thanks. Thanks for that very rich conversation um, that we started with, because certainly it allows us to go even um, more deeply into our analysis of both race and racism, right? And so if you were able to view the video, then you heard discussions of separate and unequal. You heard issues of who had access and who didn't. And so the next panel is a group of present um, employees in the organization, principals, teachers, who will bring perspective around these topics. And so again, panelists, I would invite you to introduce yourself as you um, seek to answer the questions that are advanced. But I don't want to skip, off, skip over those issues that, that Joshua just put forward, right? So let's start this discussion with having a, a conversation about the achievement gap. And I'm going to I'm going to offer a bit because I think this is really important for students to appreciate in terms of what is in the literature around issues of equity and access in these existing gaps. Gaps in achievement tell us more about institutions than they do about students. Right. And so very often our young people are reading these data and they are internalizing these messages that would suggest that there is a problem inherent in their ability to learn. And what the literature would tell us is that achievement gaps are more a description of the sufficiency or lack thereof of the structural supports that are in place to meet the pluralistic needs of our young folks. And when we sort of contextualize that in Baltimore County, we appreciate the complexity of the question of ensuring that there is an inclusive learning opportunity for each and every student because our district is so diverse. And so panel, as you go to engage around this particular issue, I'd like to start by asking, what are your thoughts on how you address gaps in achievement that may show up in your data? how you are thinking about mitigating that opportunity gap that we know oftentimes is what underlies the achievement gap as you do your work in Baltimore County. And so I'll go on mute and invite you to share. And Lisa, ask them to introduce themselves when they come up. Yeah. Don't forget introductions. Hi there, I can start. I am Kelly O'Connell, the proud principal at Mars Estates Elementary School in Essex. Um, and first, I just want to um, take my hat off to all the kids that are leading this work. Um, this work is so important. Um, it, I am really proud to um, learn and listen with the children in Baltimore County right now. Um, so I just want to thank them. But um, so much was brought up this evening that um, you know, has has me in my thinking space, my feeling space. And when Lisa, when you ask ab about um, what are we doing to mitigate that achievement gap, um, you know, as a white woman um, leading a school that's predominantly made up of, of about 60% black students, um, it is, we have this year after year, th this achievement gap where my, my black students are not um, achieving at the same rate as, as my, my white students. And um, you know we're putting in all of this work year after year, and we keep seeing the same results. And one thing that we're we're currently doing, which I um, you know am being very vulnerable and putting it out there, is that we really haven't done a lot of work where we as white educators are really looking at the implicit bias that we have because we have been brought up in this system um, of inst institutionalized racism. Um, where we have bias and that we may not even realize that we are unintending, um, our unintended impacts are, um, might be causing some of these gaps. So some of the work that we're doing here at Mars Estates is um, that we're going to be doing moving forward is really thinking about what actions and, and deconstructing ourselves, deconstructing um, the decisions that we make, the behaviors that we participate in and, and how do we um, play into that. Um, one thing that we noticed a couple of years ago um, when I visited the middle school, um, I realized that I could walk in a class 
and I can see a class full of, of white students with maybe one or two black students. And without even anyone telling me, I knew that was the advanced class or that was the GT class. Um, and, and that was a problem. Um, so here at Mars Estates, um, we really pushed on, on each other. We pushed on our teachers to provide more access, to provide more opportunity for our students in fifth grade to be in the, um, the advanced math class. And um, at first we only had seven students of, of color maybe that were in, in that class. There were actually seven students total that were in the class, to be honest. And now it's our largest class. We have 25 students in the class and um, majority are, are black or brown and they are thriving. Um, and, and it was just because we gave them this opportunity and we believed that the teacher could do the work and that the kids can do the work and um, you know it's really not being defensive it's not trying to say well we do it already um, it's you know we have to be honest we have to be honest with um, how we are a part of the problem if we really want to be part of the solution and so hi everybody I'm Erin DeCello I'm the principal of Colgate Elementary um, in Dundalk um, and our school um, currently enrolls, um, we are about 57% Hispanic and 9% Black. Um, and so we have many students of color um, and we see a lot of those disadvantages that have been mentioned this evening impact our students. Um, but I think I see some connection in the conversation the panel had earlier um, with this idea of the gap in academic achievement. Um, when we look at the Baltimore County Stakeholder Survey in the category of belonging, um, our black students as a school system have um, a larger disagreement that they, they are supported in our schools. And I think that speaks loud and clear. And, and honestly, um, you know, it shows up in Colgate's data, um, even with only 9% of our student body being um, black. So for me, as a principal, as a mom, as a citizen, we have to interrogate and ask questions about why that's happening. And I think linked to the achievement gap is really um, what are the biases, like Kelly mentioned, that teachers may hold or that the adults interacting with our students every day have, either when they're planning instruction, when we're selecting curricular materials, um, and when we're making those choices about what we're presenting for our kids. Um, and, and how is that impacting you know, our everyday choices and then the long-term achievement for our kids? But it always takes me back to when kids walk in a building, are they, do they feel safe? Do they have someone that they can go to when they have a problem? And I think that that data really shows up for me um, as a piece that we have to go back and ask a lot more questions about and talk to our students about um, and get more information for um, what we can do better as, as a school and as a system to support them because of that safety and that feeling of support and nurturing isn't there, then the achievement to me isn't going to follow. So I, I see that connection as well. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Brendan Penn. I'm a STEM teacher at Lions Mill Elementary. Um, and first, I just want to say thank you to all the students that are sharing their truth. And I believe you, and I respect and appreciate your honesty and your bravery uh, with the conversation we're having today. Uh, Black Lives Matter and Black Trans Lives Matter as well. Um, I've had the honor to be Baltimore County's Teacher of the Year of 2018-2019. And so that platform allowed me a lot of um, opportunity to do recruitment and retention, um, like, like Mr. Burke was talking about. And I do think that uh, as a system, we need to hold our teacher prep programs accountable. And with the teachers that we are hiring in Baltimore County, that we need to include more of a diverse um, curriculum in terms of, you know, listening to uh, professors like Dr. Cornell West, Dr. Gloria Ladson Billings, who have been doing this equity work for quite a long time and teachers are unfamiliar with, with their practices and their and their research. And so I think we need to, they're on the recruitment piece, actually really hold um, our prep programs um, accountable. But one also thing I think is important is sort of the retention of the black teachers that we have in Baltimore County and that there are lots of microaggressions and you know, the, the, I've always been, you know, one of one or one of two black teachers in a school and, you know, certain perspectives and viewpoints that I've bought up hasn't been always been appreciated or acknowledged by school leaders. And so I think as a system, you know, as we reach out and do this equity work and we reach out to professionals, I, I would like to see more respect with the teachers that we have already in Baltimore County and sort of address the systems that are in place already in schools. 
And I think in terms of the achievement gap, one of the most um, interesting parts of the Brown versus Board education in that landmark case was that teachers weren't mentioned at all. And so we integrated the schools with black students and all the black teachers lost their jobs and they weren't integrated into the school as well. And I think we're still seeing the symptoms of that decision in our schools right now. And so one also thing is I, I would like to see it throughout Baltimore County and throughout the state more programs that support black teachers that are in the county and that there's a bit less than a thousand but I, I don't know too many of them and i'd like to see more programs put in place um, where teachers can be heard and teachers uh, the pedagogy and the culturally relevant things that they're doing in the classroom are valued and are supported and shared um, among a large amount of schools um, so i and i think that's one thing that and, and another thing also is that 97 percent of teachers across maryland are rated highly effective or effective but we have these large achievement gaps. And so I think, you know, as a teacher, I, I plan to hold principals, assistant principals, coordinators, everyone accountable because we're, we're not serving our black and brown students and, and we need to do better. And so I appreciate, I'll be, I'll sit back and listen to what the students have to say because we, we need to hear you. And so I appreciate your thoughts. Thank you. Mr. Dickerson, Michael, were you gonna say something before I jump in? <laughs> Hello everybody, Abir Shanao, I'm from the Office of Social Studies. Um, we can all talk about Brown versus Board of Education, what it's done to uphold the systemic racism. Let's not forget, even with the limited resources that our black brothers and sisters had, they developed black excellence, and that's still be being developed. I think what needs to be asked is why Brown versus Board of Education, what was the point behind segregation, and how those systems that were put in place not only stripped away the needs and the wants, but also the community that we know our black and brown kids come from. Our black and brown kids are now in systems that don't reflect their own communities. They don't learn the same way as other kids do. And that's a fact, and that's something that also needs to be integrated in our schools. It's not just the fact that we're putting kids in a GT class and we're making them feel safe and comfortable. We also need to have practices that reflect where these kids come from. We know for a fact, and if you read Chris Emden's book about how black students react, it's communal. I come from a culture of community as an Arab American female. We do things as a community and that's not reflective in the schools. Therefore, kids are not going to react that way. Of course, they're gonna shut down. Of course, they're not gonna be responsive. Another major issue is kids do not see themselves in the things that are being taught to them, to the uh, books that they're reading, to the videos that's being showed, to the materials that are being presented. As a history curriculum writer, the, the struggle to sit here and we sit there and talk about not whitewashing curriculum, there's no way in American history, can you talk about American history without talking about the influence that black people have had ever since they set foot? Also, as a Muslim female, there's no way I can give homage to anybody or any Muslim community without giving homage to my black brothers and sisters, and sisters especially as they came as enslaved people and continue to practice. Every facet of this country was built by the black community. And for us to strip that away and not have our students from kindergarten all the way until they graduate, not see that reflected until you have snippets of curriculum is also damaging. Kids need to see themselves. We also need to speak up for the kids who cannot speak, such as our students who are from immigrant countries. We also don't meet the social emotional needs of our kids who come from war-torn countries. Let's talk about our students who come from Iraq or Syria or Yemen or Somalia or Afghanistan or parts of China that have, or even Central America, where we talk about the, I don't call them microaggressions, they're flat out aggressions. When you have teachers who come in with implicit bias and we have political agendas, agendas that we follow that spill into the classroom, what are their perspectives on these students? And who's gonna speak for those students who A, were stripped away from where they came from and B, now the language is a barrier. Who are we speaking up for them as well? Uh, we need to make sure that all of those, we don't teach students as a whole anymore. It's all compartmentalized. We teach in silos. Kids need to be taught in a holistic manner, which is why, and that's how you created, going back to my black excellence, you had that community effort and that was stripped away from black students with Brown versus the Board of Education because there's still that debate of whether it was good or whether it was not but not until our kids see themselves and we have a diverse team of people writing curriculum so they can have that perspective, are the structures gonna be changed because we need to allow kids to have the supports to advocate for themselves as well. And the only way they can see that is if they're in a constant classroom 
teaching them these skill sets and not just content. Dates will always be there, people will always be there, but the most important thing is we need to start looking at our kids as model, as our model citizens to uphold the next generation. So if we don't give them those skill sets, then we failed as educators as well. And bringing in teachers of color, that's wonderful, but now also we also have to hold our white teachers accountable for being able to address the needs of our students. If we have a, a county that's two thirds students of color, I mean, then something really has to change with how we're addressing their needs, what's going on in the classrooms, and how structures are in place, because those also really have to change in order for our kids to see and feel safe as well. Okay, all right. <laughs> so it just got real. Um, so for the viewing audience, I hope you are using your compass and noticing where you are, because we're gonna keep pushing into this conversation. So I have actually several wonderings based on what was shared. Um, and I am thinking about all of the ways in which we signal you belong and you don't belong, right? And so we've had conversations about microaggressions. That's what the literature calls them. But to your point, Abir, sometimes they're just aggressions. There's nothing micro about them, right? Um, I'm thinking about walking into a class and you know the level because of the lack of diversity, right? And what that communicates to the students in that classroom, what it communicates to the students who are not in that classroom, right? And like, what kinds of conversations are we having with our young people about their own social emotional wellness, their development of identity? We know that identity um, and, and sense of perception as an academician is hugely important to student achievement, particularly to students of color, black students in particular. So I want to I want you all to talk a little bit about what your experience has been in having courageous conversations with students about their own sense of self concept around um, you know seeing themselves as academicians and let's center our black students in general, our students of color um, in, in particular as we have this conversation. And so I'll go on mute. I think I'll jump. Okay. <laughs> um, I think as an I for myself, I am probably one of the few. Uh, I'm going to say hijabi as a woman, a Muslim woman who covers in the county. Now, the sense of identity is very important, and also I'm going to speak local personal media as a Muslim female who does cover. When I walk into schools and I see other Muslim females who have been who see me, they automatically, we automatically connect. The sense of identity is strong. The, the idea that we need to not have everybody identifying everybody's equal, there's nothing wrong with having that strong identity. And that also has helped me when I was in my residency in some of the schools develop a mentoring program, because going back again, for a lot of students who come from other countries, they're not prepared to navigate how American society works. I'm blessed that I was born and raised here. Uh, my family has been here for you know uh, generations, but we don't prepare our kids also to know how to navigate. So giving them the opportunity to gravitate towards people who look like them, who act like them, is very, very powerful. And I'd also like to make a point that speaking about religion is technically taboo, but what people don't understand, coming from a Muslim perspective, you can be Muslim and you can still also be African-American or you can be Muslim and you can be pretty from Pakistan. What people don't understand is when I talk about Muslim students, we are not a monolith, but we are the most diverse group of people in the world. So if I'm going to come into a conference and I'm going to talk about Muslim students, I'm not sitting there and saying I'm denouncing whether it's Christianity, Judaism, Buddhism, whatever. I'm just saying that there's that common thread that people need to understand. Because again, going back to the issue is, Anti-Muslim bigotry, or what people call Islamophobia, is the last form of bigotry that's actually most acceptable. And we see it all the time. So when we have our students in the classroom and they're watching the news and then they come home, that fear is real. So the sense of identity is very important because they're gonna be they're gonna feel safe to speak, to to flourish, to do whatever it is. So it's always that support and people are always like, well, what's the big deal if you have a, you know, a black male? It's a big deal. But when you haven't lived that experience and when you've had had everything your entire life, there's nothing else that you're looking for because it's always been there for you. So for me, especially as a Muslim female and as a Muslim in, in a large county, identity is a, is a very big thing. 
for, for me as a black teacher, um, my, my job is to affirm students' black excellence. And that's something Josh asked the question to Mr. Dickerson as well about navigating stereotypes and those microaggressions. And Mr. Dickerson is right. You're going to experience it that your entire life. I was very fortunate to have parents that instilled that in me that no matter what people say, you are excellent and you are. we, we demand of you to be excellent. And I demand my students to be excellent because they are going to face that gauntlet and if we try to whitewash things or protect them in a bubble, they're going to be wholly unprepared for that and that, that I wouldn't be doing my job. And so curriculum and academics is important, but if I'm not affirming their blackness, their culture, their perspective, um, social injustice in the world, kids see that. They don't live in a bubble, and so we need to talk about it. Yes, as an elementary school teacher, I need to be careful with some things just aren't developmentally appropriate, but things about presidential elections, police violence the kids kids are aware and so i want to open up that space and allow students you know again you may hear these things but again the the work you put in the talents that you have are important and they have value and you cannot let anybody shake that from you and so i think that's something that um a, a, as a system as teacher individual teachers need to have that work to affirm students culture not just black students but latinx students and so we we need to teach students about other cultures which is a major point that dr gloria latin billings talks about is that we need to be well versed um, in other people's cultures as well we can't be sheltered and live in a bubble and you know baltimore county has blessed my life i have been fortunate to represent the teachers of baltimore county um but but i think that and so i'm a living proof of black excellence in education and I take that very seriously and you know my students were very appreciative and we celebrated and it was a great thing but also you know I experienced those microaggressions and racism every single day um, I've had articles written about me and other educators printed in newspapers and they completely cut me out of the article even though my name was Selena they, they cut me out and so again that doesn't diminish my work that doesn't diminish my accomplishments or the work that I do but those things do ex exist and so we need to prepare students for those things so that they can do better. Um, and you know, the, the 21st century workplace is students need to be content creators. YouTubers, streamers, coders are, you know, if we look at the graduation rates, there, there are not black and brown students in, in those majors getting those doctorate advanced degrees. And so we need to do better to instill the excellence that is black students, that they have creativity, they have those skills, and they need to have those opportunities to excel in those areas. And I think that's something we need to see in elementary, middle, and high school. I think, um, um, oh, go ahead, Erin. I, I have just a short little thing. Um, so in listening and kind of thinking, um, as a white woman who is also an educator in our school system, um, for me, you know, I've had some experiences lately where I had to take a step back and really examine myself. Um, and that's tough to do. Um, when you're examining yourself with racism. And so one example is I was in a book discussion yesterday um, and I shared that my reasoning for participating was that I felt an urgency to really um, say something, take part, learn. Um, and that's, that's what I've actively been doing. And a black female who was a participant very graciously reminded me that it, this has always been urgent. And so there for me was my whiteness and my white privilege. It hasn't been urgent to me all the time because I have this skin. So now I feel even more <laughs> compelled. And I think the words sometimes aren't there for me, um, especially when leading teachers and a staff where you see bias show up or where you don't know sometimes where they are um, in their belief system and, and what they're providing for kids. Um, but as an administrator, I feel that this is the time for me to leverage my learning and to leverage whatever I can do to keep speaking up, um, standing up when I, when I notice um, racist comments, you know, interrupting those things that are happening around me where before I'm, I don't know, sometimes I may have said that's not funny, but now, based on the things that I'm learning and spending time listening, um, I know that it's my work that I need to do and my responsibility to be able to speak up and stand up.
And so as, as a person that I am, that's, that's where I am um, in my my everyday life. And I'll, I'll just kind of um, add that, you know, when we think about um, identity work um, and, you know, my, my staff is predominantly white female um, staff. We are, are working on trying to um, increase our black teacher um, population. Um, but unfortunately, um, we have not had that much success. Um, we've had little success, but, but not enough. Um, so as, as white educators in, in our building, um, some simple things like, what does your classroom library look like? Can the kids even see themselves in the books that they read every day? Um, what books are you choosing to model your lessons um, when you're doing your direct instruction? Um, and, you know, a few years ago, I, I had a staff member who, who came aboard and, and kind of pushed on me and, and ordered all of these amazing texts and, um, you know, forming relationships with kids. And I'll often, you know, have lunch with kids and um, they're coming in my office and, you know, seeing a book with the title Black Girls Rock. And um, they're, they're just light up because they're so thrilled that their white principal would have this book on her shelf. Um, and, um, you know, it really is, it, it is just so, so important. But I think we have to be very careful as white folks, and I'll speak local and mean it, as a white woman, uh, educator, or principal here, am I doing shallow work or am I going deep enough? Um, is the identity work that we're doing surface? Like, great, she has books in her office. Um, or are we really giving students a voice? Am I listening to the student's voice? Um, I think five years ago or six years ago, if a student said to me um, as, as a school leader that she was racist about a teacher or she treated me like that because she's racist, I probably would have tried to convince the student of all the great things about that teacher, all the things that I think are wonderful about that teacher. Now, I'm more open to saying, tell me more. Why do you feel that? What happened? And then we can have a very honest conversation with the teacher. And the teachers at my school are very open, for the most part, to hear how a child may have perceived a racist action. And then we can actually do the work and the child feels valued and the teacher is willing to, to look inside. And, um, you know, I, I see myself, like Erin um, says, evolving every day and learning every day. And, and as, a, as, a, as a white person, I, there's so much I don't know. And when we know better, we can do better. Um, and, you know, just being open to constantly wanting to know better so that we can do better for, for our kids. So you all have said so much, and I just want to ask one final question before we get to our student panel, our big dance. Um, and Brendan, I want I want to ask that you respond to this question first because I'm gonna try to pull some things together. Um, this is the part where I get excited. So Kelly, <laughs> Kelly, what you alluded to is like the heart of this work, right? Which is the transformation. It's not the transaction; it's the transformation. It is that I internalize different ways of being. I understand things better with more depth, right? Um, and that is so critically important. And so we've been talking during this panel about the idea of black excellence. And so what I want to submit for our consideration is that a huge part of this problem is we don't center um, through our learning, through our becoming, the voices of people who have been successful with Black children as we matriculate that pathway to teaching, to leading. And so all of the work around Black excellence, right, we don't necessarily get access to in the same ways that we get um, exposure to Eurocentric models. And so... Um, this question of how we create space to actually learn from people who have been successful with black children, who have been successful with other children of color, indigenous children, et cetera, et cetera, so that that becomes a part of our pedagogy, right? What happens, what just naturally happens in the classroom. That's what happens in our leadership, right? I get why this matters as a white woman for my black students, for my Muslim students, et cetera, et cetera, right? That is a way of being that we have to internalize and it should transform how we do teaching and learning and leading. And so um, with that backdrop, what I want to invite um, is us some, to have some conversation about, so what are those voices um, of Black excellence, right, um, that really inform your practice when you engage with Black students, with non-white students, that are really beneficial for the whole of the community that you would want to call forward? So I'll go on mute for your responses. I mean, I think first and foremost, but 
is identity is we're all people. And, and I think a, a lot of teachers have fear because there are differences racially, religious, sexual orientation, whatever that may be. But first and foremost, I, I wanted to connect with people I, I, just as people. And I think teachers need to extend themselves between the, you know, beside the bells, not just 8.30 to 3.30. And so a lot of the work that I do in my school is, you know, a lot of academic uh, pushing during the day, but also I create lots of game nights, um, STEM expos on Saturdays, again, where I, I want us just to connect as people that yes, I'm your teacher, but you see me as a black man. I like video games, I like sports. And so let's just connect as people. And when you are able to share your truth with people and you know where they're coming from, you hear their story, it's really hard to hate someone. And so I think, and that removes fear. And so I think a lot of teachers need to get to know um, their students and know the parents of their students and connect with, you know, not, not as a mom teacher, but just mom to mom. And sometimes that kid that's driving you crazy all day through class, yeah, and sit down with the mom. The mom knows the same thing, and so do you. So just sit down and talk about it. Connect as people first, then we can connect professionally. And I think that the fear, and there's a lot of teachers that don't live in their community where they work, and so they're off, you know, somewhere else, and they're, you know, investing in their in their child's school and not putting that same investment in the student in the you know in the school that they work in. Um, and so I, you know, I know there's a. I've even heard people say, I wouldn't send my kid to this school. And I think that's a starting point where if you feel that way, you need to do a lot of work to create that school environment where you would send your kid to that school. Um, and so I, I think that's some of the work that I do is really trying to connect with kids and getting to know them. It's really hard to do that 8.30 to 3.30 with a class of 25. You need to create other opportunities where you, kids can excel or maybe that kid that's bouncing off the walls, let him to go to a game night, let him perform, let him sing, let him dance, find out more about that student um, and then provide, and that'll inform your instruction. So I think getting to know families, leaders, community partners, just as people is so important, um, especially for our black and brown students. Who'd like to go next? I don't have an order in my mind. I wanna go last. So Lisa, repeat the question again, please. I'm really wondering, I'm wondering as you think about centering the learning needs of, of your students, um, your non-white students, like what are some of those practices that rise to the fore that are really important for you um, in this in this leg of your journey? So I think, so, um, oh, go ahead, Eric. Go ahead, Eric. No, I learned first last time, you can talk. Go ahead. Um, I, I think, you know, it kind of goes back again to really um, knowing who our kids are, knowing um, that knowing their interests, knowing uh, and not generalizing what their interests are, like truly, really knowing, um, really knowing about their culture and um, not judging based on my lived experience or my culture or, or my teacher's lived experiences and having them not not judge and using that information when we are um, doing the, the teaching and learning. And I think it goes back to what Brendan said as well. It's really all about the relationship, right? But an authentic relationship that um, kids really feel um, like they're, they're I don't want to say loved because that's like so cliche, right? Well, I love all my kids, um, but it, it really is a, about knowing and, and loving everything about them, loving their blackness, loving their 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 home life, loving their family. And, and that's really what I think this work is, is about. And the kids can tell, um, you know, I, I'm very proud that a lot of my teachers had courage. A, a lot of my white teachers had courage to have some um, real conversations with their classes um, over remote learning. You know, that's scary. The parents are in the classroom with the teacher and, and the kids. And, you know, some of the kids said to, the, to one teacher in particular, I can think of one story, and the teacher told me, a student said to her, wow, you're just like us. You treat us like you're black. It's kind of like you're black. You treat us the way black people treat us. And, you know, to that teacher, she was just so, um, first of all, she was crying because she, she couldn't even you know, fathom that her students had to even experience that. But at the same token was so, um, I think, honored with herself, and I certainly was, that she's connected. She's found a way to truly connect, and it's an authentic, deep connection. Um, so I think that that's the work that we have to do. Um, and, and again, it's just going deeper. You know, it's, it's, it's getting below the surface. And um, I would add to, um, at the beginning of the last year and during the course of the last school year, um, our staff 
took some time to investigate a book by Sarah Ahmed called Being the Change. Um, and she provides some lessons that are really centered around honoring each person. Um, and so, um, you know, at the beginning of the year, you allow each student to create an identity map. And it's really centered around who they are. Um, and I think that not only giving kids that time and space to do that in their classroom with their teacher and with their classmates is important, but also time and space for our teachers to explore the importance of doing that with their kids had a big impact on our um, teachers. Um, and then the other thing that um, I've been thinking about is, you know, we saw some of our students very differently during this remote learning time. Um, and so when Brennan was talking about some of the kids that might be, you know, very active in the classroom or may learn differently than others, um, we saw some students um, really thrive and show a different way of learning remotely. And I think teachers were um, excited and sometimes um, surprised by um, the way that child really excelled. And so I think the learning from that for teachers and educators for all of us is that what we're doing as the adults needs to change. You know, if a child isn't being successful and isn't thriving and growing, then maybe we need to alter the way that we're delivering the instruction or we need to change something within the classroom to better suit the way that that So I think it really supports thinking about each individual child and giving them that time and space to explore their identity and honor it um, for each person. Thanks. And so, Abia, you get the last word on this one. <laughs> I think what I would like to say is this concept of othering is what's also damaging to our students. You know, we all love our kids, but, you know, people say you can't love black kids if you don't know them but also kids know and feel a sense of authenticity. So even if you go in there not knowing and learning, they will gravitate towards you, kids will teach you. But this concept of othering is also what needs to be changed because we come in thinking kids have deficiencies. Just because they don't speak the language doesn't mean they're deficient in something else. Honing into that and honoring their experiences and honoring their struggles, it's really what's going to make a rich experience for these kids. Because also, if we're just talking about our, our kids from other countries, I, as a child of immigrants, it's hard learning two languages. But think of the cognitive skills it takes. So instead of thinking it as a deficiency, think of it as a skill set that you have to code switch. And also kids who are from America, say we have kids who live in lower socioeconomic I mean, I came from the south side of Chicago, and when my brother went to law school and came back, he definitely had to do that code switching. You go back into your neighborhood, and people look at you sideways, but then you also develop those skills, and that's what kids need to know, and that's also a big skill set. Knowing how to code switch, knowing how to use those cognitive skills is what we should look at as an asset and not an othering. And once we develop that with all of our students, then we're able to sit there and say, everybody has something to give, and how are we going to use that to make everybody thrive and grow into the classroom? With that, I would say your work is done. Mr. Dickerson, <laughs> back over to you. You know, I, I really hope everyone watching sees what's happening here. We're really building the narrative. That was an incredible panel. Thanks to all of you all. And I want to call in Dr. Williams for a quick moment before we go over to Instagram Live, because uh, you know these are these are your teachers, your principals, your staff in Baltimore County Public Schools, Doc. And I mean, those stories and the way they personalize them couldn't have been more real. So thank you, Mr. Dickerson, and to all of you, thank you for those stories. I was sitting here like taking notes because <laughs> it's it was so impressive to hear each one of you speak about your own journey and your work whether it was difficult, whether it was professional, whether it was personal. And to that point, that's the work that we have to get to our students, each and every one of them, and get to know them, find out what they like, but stretch them and challenge them. So I just want to thank this panel for the honest conversation, for your leadership, and for your service to Baltimore County Public Schools. I turn it back over to you, Michael Dickinson. Thank you, sir. Um, we have a lot of questions in the in the Q and A, and you know a lot of the answers to those questions are being addressed in the panels we've had. They will also be addressed in upcoming panels. So um, we haven't forgot about those, and 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 hopefully, if we have some time near the end, we can 
we can try to get a couple of those questions, but we don't want to stand in the way of, of our students. Um, before we go to the third panel, I want to spend some time with Josh and Omar to really allow them to talk about some of the conversations they've been having over on Instagram Live, and, and I'll repeat it again for those who may be joined later. Uh, this was inspired by students, and certainly Josh and Omar have been in the forefront um, of, of asking that this happen because these students were having these conversations absent of adults and we certainly felt like we needed to provide space with adults for them to have these conversations so josh i'll turn it over to you and omar for a little bit before we uh go to the uh, next panel which is a panel of students yeah so basically um here, omar's here let me let him talk he hasn't talked too much hey guys omar how are you How's everyone doing? Doing great. So we we just ended our Instagram live. Um, we had we hit like about like 120 students. It was it was amazing. We had some serious conversation going on. Uh, the time was just flowing through. I we didn't even notice that uh, we went past the hour, but we had some serious conversations. A lot of the big points that were brought up were um, seeing people like you in our classrooms. Um, seeing people like us in leadership roles, um, a lot of the students talked about how they only had a, a very limited amount of uh, teachers of color in their classrooms and how they felt about that. Um, they talked about how clubs like, let's say, uh, Black Student Union um, is only focused on students of color and that you don't really see any white people or Asian people, like different keep group of people in that club except that certain club and that they're trying to everyone wants to see that change because the whole point of having uh, these conversations is that we have everyone together. Uh, we have a perspective from you, I have a perspective from Josh, a perspective from everyone so we can actually talk about it and see what's what's the, what's the difference in the mindset here. What are we trying to change? What are we trying to fix? Um, and another huge topic for a lot of them uh, was our history and what we learn in our schools. A big topic is, I guess, a lot of us this year have learned about what June 19th, Juneteenth is. Um, honestly, I didn't even know what that was until last year, until I did my own research. I think someone brought it up to me, and I'm like, oh, what is that? And I learned about it. Uh, but definitely uh, a change in our curriculum and the way we teach things, especially African American history. A lot of students talked about having an African American history class just dedicated to that. Uh, because it, it's a huge topic, and uh, they, they, a lot of kids talked about how we, we have, we spend a lot of time on like focusing on the Holocaust and things that are important, like that, that we need to know the history about, but we need to have the same type of um, impact and to conversations when we're talking about racism and slavery and everything that's been going on. Uh, but we had some really good conversation going on. We had different students come on, elementary, high schoolers, um, and middle schoolers. And we didn't have any elementary, uh, but middle schoolers, high schoolers. But it was really good. I really appreciated the the, the comments we had from students. They talked about um, some of the school structures, and by that they meant, hey, like, why are these schools um, uh, with less AP class options in this school? Um, just, just. They were just going at every every topic, honestly, and it was pretty impressive. We had a really good conversation. Uh, for the things that we couldn't answer, we told them, hey, like you can always reach out to your uh, school leadership, your school board members, Joshua, uh, our superintendent, you guys. Uh, but we had some really good conversation going on, and I'm really happy with this event. Um, I'm glad to see you guys have a lot on your side, too. Dr. Williams has popped in. Doc, you want to talk to Omar and Josh for a bit? Well, I just want to say to Omar and Joshua, I would love to see those items that you described. I know it was oh, yeah, a lot yeah. within the within the hour, but I guess the next step if somehow we can capture that because I have senior members watching this as well. So I heard a lot what you're talking about. We've been talking about the recruitment effort. We, you talked about clubs. You talked about course offerings. So I would love to to get that. And, and I'll just put a plug out there. The students are still on the line. We need students to consider education, going into the field of teaching. Um, uh, Ms. Uh, Stokes, I believe, talked about um, her, her, her plight in going to Coppin and to Morgan. Um, just the other day, I wrote to my alma mater down there at Hampton University. Um, because we just don't have that strong pipeline. And if, if, if students aren't interested, 
by the high school time, then they're not going to go into the field of education, whether it's elementary or secondary. So we, we do have our Teacher Academy of Maryland. We have increased um, that pipeline, but I would just say for all those who are watching, we need for our young folks to consider education. I've been doing it for 30 some odd years. It's the best thing that I've done in terms of my professional career. Of course, my family is the, sec is the first best thing that I did. But I'm just saying, uh, it, we need that strong pipeline of getting our young folks interested in education. But I love to just see that list of items that you all gathered because it we, matters. We can definitely get you that list. But like okay. you said, um, a, a big we actually had that same conversation. Hey, like we need more students of color to want to go into teaching. And um, we had a really good point from one of the students saying they went to Western Tech or something, um, was that, if they saw more teachers like them, they would consider that field. Uh, they talked about how, especially at like the elementary and middle school level, we don't really understand why things are the way they are, why there aren't that many um, African-American teachers or teachers of color. And that, I guess that, that they're saying that that has an effect with the uh, career options that they pick, or they might think, hey, like, oh, teaching isn't for someone like me, uh, being an administrator isn't for someone like me. So that's a really good point, and I definitely agree. Te uh, I feel like education is a really good field to get into, but we can get you that list. All right, thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Omar, Josh. Thank you, Dr. Williams. Listen, we're going to transition. Omar and Josh are going to be on, each are going to be on one of the last two panels we have. Um, you know how it goes, time flies when you're having fun. So we're running right through this. I'm gonna turn it right over to Lisa and she can bring on the next panel, which is a panel of students. As I said, Joshua is one of the student members and I think we have four or five other students who are gonna take part in this next panel. I'm excited for it, Lisa, so I'll turn it over to you. All right, so if we could have our student panelists to enable your cameras and, and let's just jump right in. Um, as has been our custom, if you could introduce yourself and um, identify the school that you attend, that would be awesome. And here's what I'd like to just throw out, right? Um, it is so important that this work be pushed by your voices. It is so important that we center your lived experience, your perspective around what the work is that is most important for the organization to attend to. Um, is, is similar is what drives what it is that we do. So here's my here's my question um, for the student panel. What is the thing that you want us to take away from this conversation as it relates to race, as it relates to racism, and as it relates to the imperative for Baltimore County Public Schools? So with that, I will go on mute and you all can go at it. And make sure you introduce yourselves. Okay. Um, hi, guys. Uh, my name is Joshua Mahamza, and I am the new student member of the board for Baltimore County uh, for the year 2020 and 2021. I, I'm a rising senior at Dundalk High School. And um, to your question, Ms. Uh, Dr. Williams, uh, I think the one thing I want to be taken away from this event is um, understanding the disparities amongst our students, um, especially of color and different socioeconomic backgrounds. And what uh, can we as a school system and we and teachers especially support those uh, students? Thanks, Joshua. Hi, I guess I'll go next. Um, unfortunately, I'm so sorry I can't turn my camera on since I'm calling in, but this is Carmeli Leal. Um, I'm a rising senior as well, um, and I'm attending Eastern Technical High School. Um, I also currently serve as the Maryland Association um, of Student Council's president for the 2020-21 school year. Um, and then to go to your question, Dr. Williams, I think uh, something that's really important for me personally, and I know for a lot of other people kind of going into this conversation, is really understanding the intersectionality of, of race and racism. Um, just knowing that you know, this facet of identity impacts every single part of our school system and our school buildings. Um, and so if, we, if we're really talking about, you know, providing a world-class education and providing and supporting for our students, um, this is one thing especially that can't be ignored. Thanks. So important. I'll go ahead and jump in. Oh, yep. Sorry, go ahead. 
No, go for it. Um, I'll go ahead and jump in now. My name is Samantha Warfell. I am a rising sophomore at Hereford High School, and I'm currently serving as the interim president for the Baltimore County Student Councils. And I could not agree with Carmeli more. Um, but I'd also like to add, as a student who has grown up in a predominantly white community and a predominantly white school system, or not school system, but in predominantly white schools, um, I have witnessed and caught wind of conversations among students in which racial slurs have been tossed around as jokes and microaggressions, which, as mentioned, are sometimes just flat-out aggressions, um, have been brushed off as normal, so to speak. And I can only begin to imagine um, how such comments have affected and will continue to affect our black and brown students within the Baltimore County Public Schools um, without dismantling this in idea of implicit bias um, that I know for a fact that many students within my school and my community have grown up with. So I think that this idea really begins with, you know, educating students as young as elementary um, in terms of implicit bias and how, you know, our educators can really come into play um, and be vital parts of, of, you know, of dismantling this system of implicit bias and setting an example for young students as well. Thanks for your thoughts. Any other panelists? Hi, can you hear me? Hello. Yeah, we can hear you. Um, my name is Vinay Tosla. I'm a member of the Baltimore County Student Council, and I was a former candidate for student member of the board this year. Um, I think one of the important things that um, is, I think, really being discussed a lot more, and I've definitely discussed this with other students who've brought it up, is the presence of, like, blatantly or even subtly like racist or prejudiced like material in our curriculums like 12th graders at least at Delaney High School oh, sorry I'm from Delaney High School if I didn't say that um and at Delaney like they read the Heart of Darkness which is a book about like you know the conquering of Africa by like European explorers and it's you know it's really just for a black student to read that and I've read it before myself, it's, it would be, you know, really triggering. It's really like, you know, just psychologically like damaging to like read the way it's written. And then you have books like Huckleberry, like Huckleberry Finn and Tom Sawyer, which like have racial slurs in them. And I just can't imagine what it would feel like to read that as a black student. And I think that that really needs to be addressed because there are a lot of books and a lot of literature and a lot of material that can be used to you know, teach students that don't contain such content as those, you know, pieces of literature and that can make learning a much more comfortable experience for students of color, which I feel like learning should never be something that you should be afraid of and learning should never be something that makes you feel uncomfortable or less than, but I feel like that's what those books essentially do. So that's definitely a conversation and something that we need to continue to like work on as a county. Um, hello, my name Oh, sorry. Go for it. Um, my name is Kennedy Smith, and I'm a rising 12th grader at George Washington Carver Center for Arts and Technology. And I think that one thing that we need to do is um, stop um, allowing that the racist cultures in some schools. I know my school has an issue with it, but allowing the racism and for the, allowing the racism to become a part of our cultures in our schools and allowing it to spread throughout our schools because we've had several issues with racism. And it has been difficult because uh, the black community and people of color in our school have seen this go on for many years and seen it go on for the entirety of that we're in school. And it seems that a lot of stuff hasn't been changing or those people haven't been facing severe consequences and it's um, affecting the students because it makes them feel like their administration and their staffing at the school doesn't have their back. So I feel like not allowing that racist culture or the racism to even enter the schools or be tolerated into the schools should be a really big thing. Thanks. Yeah. Is there anyone who hasn't spoke who'd like an opportunity now before I ask one? Hi. Okay, go for Hello. it. Hello, I'm Bethlehem Wolde. I'm from Cadenceville High School. And just to piggyback off of 
what a lot of other people have been saying. I've been a part of and helped organize the Cadenceville Youth for Black Lives Matter um, protest. And one of the main things that we also push for is a disparity between who are the expelling rates and how it just statistics show that African Americans in counties worldwide are disproportionately expelled and punished. And that has deep rooted psychological effects. And as many people know, the school to prison pipeline that um, no one is not guilty of contributing to even our own county, because in, if we were to look at the rates at which schools even like more diverse schools expel people and punish kids, it's more harshly driven towards African Americans. And I really hope that um, as a board and just as a county as a whole, that we're going to push towards the decriminalization of African Americans, even within our own schools, because no one is not subject to doing so. And we all carry our own biases and we all have a lot of learning and unlearning to do. But something that we really have to highlight is that if we don't want to keep being a main contributor to the criminalization and profiling of African Americans, specifically African American males, we have to push away from and start having further levels of just not like punishing and just throwing kids and exiling them and putting them on the permanent record forever and rather giving them a chance at rehabilitation and reestablishing themselves. Any other thoughts? So I want I want to ask another question, but I want to summarize what I think I heard from the, the student panel. And if I miss something, please feel free to call me in, right? So here's my question. Um, as we think about the time that we have and this, this larger question of how we move this work forward, my wondering for the students on the call is, what would you tell us about the ways in which we need to be more courageous around issues of race and racism in the organization, right? So the question is, what are the ways that you need us to be more courageous around race and racism? And here's what I think I heard you, you all um, outline as issues that you've had around this topic in your own lived experience. Blatant racist um, elements in the curriculum that you can imagine being triggering for different groups of students, a racist culture that seems to be tolerated, um, these ex, uh, disproportionate rates of expulsion and wonderings about the deep roots of impacts related to those uh, phenomena. Um, how do we get around to decriminalizing decriminal African-American students as a result of this, this connectedness between um, black bodies and expulsion rates? Um, understanding the disparities that exist across data sets um, understanding the intersectionality of identity and how it should inform how we engage teaching and learning. Um, the normalization of racial slurs as jokes that can just be bandied about in the culture. Um, and then really dealing with the issue of implicit bias and deinstitutionalizing bias across the organization. Is there something that I missed? Uh, no. I think you're spot I think that I think that's something that... Um, the reason why these issues haven't been, because this is this overall should have been a conversation that should have been had a long time ago, and it shouldn't just be happening because of all of the momentum. We should have always been talking about this. But I think a main issue is that we constantly put white comfort over black expression and minority input. And that's the reason why that all of these things have arised to the point that they have, because if we're constantly prioritizing white history or we don't want to offend white people by having the hard conversations, that's just, again, another form of oppression against African-Americans because we're not allowed to put in the proper input and proper criticism. So in order to take these steps and in order to accomplish all the things that we've said, we need to face the reality that this isn't about comfort anymore. We're all going to have to get very uncomfortable and we're all going to have to teach ourselves and learn some new things. But at the end of the day, we can't just keep avoiding conversations just because they make us feel uneasy or they're too hard because that just further contributes to the problem and lets it grow. Kennedy, I could not agree with you more. And I think a large part of this conversation um, that should be continued and continue to be had within schools um, is is normalizing discomfort and normalizing the changing of opinions and, you know, just ultimately, um, you know, seeing and viewing discomfort 
as a step to progress and a step that we have to take to see a better future for our black and brown brothers and sisters within the school system. Sammy, you bring up such a good point of just how, um, you know, normalizing that it's, it's okay to be changing your opinion when presented with new information. Um, and honestly, that's what school is all about, right? It's about education and it's about learning. And, um, you know, I think BCPS does a really good job of emphasizing the fact that school, um, you're not just learning things to learn things. It's, it's meant to prepare you for the real world. Um, and so I think this is this is a part of the real world. These are real world issues that are you know that are permeating our entire school system, whether it whether it be on the board of education or whether it be within our school classrooms. Um, and so really dealing with implicit biases and overt you know overt um, displays of racism on all on all levels. Other thoughts? How do we need to be more courageous in this moment? Um, I'll just like to add um, for like leadership in our uh, school system, um, especially the board. I think um, they should stop, uh, like you guys mentioned, uh, normalizing um, racism because they don't want to uh, take on the hard, uh, they don't want to have this hard conversation. And with the board, I know like some members are elected and um, they have to um, uh, please uh, their constituencies. But sometimes when uh, you have to talk about things like race, um, things about uh, discrimination of uh, a certain uh, minority, you have to have, you have to be courageous. Uh, and um, you cannot allow um, this uh, tyranny of majority uh, 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 kind of Make you to decide. Uh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Um, I agree with what everyone has been saying, but I also think having a space for students to be able to have those hard discussions with not only their white counterparts, but with adults and administrators, and having that hard conversation with people who may or may not be coming, may or may not be going through the same situation. I think giving students a safe place where they can go and talk and not feel judged or have some have their opinion feel worthless or useless giving them just that space where they can talk and feel comfortable because i know some students in my school they don't feel always feel comfortable going to their white teachers talking about race issues going on they always feel more comfortable going to our black teachers or our black administrators because it just gives them a, makes them feel uneasy or makes them feel like the conversation can't relate because their white teacher may not be going through that thing or may, may not ever go through those experiences so i think giving our diverse safe space for students to be able to hold those hard conversations is another way to fix the issues and give students courage. Yeah, and that like directly ties into the fact that there is a very, like a lot of people, again, what was said in the live stream and a lot of other things is that a lot of us have never had teachers that look like us, share the same struggles as us, same, share the same experiences as us. And when we don't see ourselves represented, we don't feel safe. If we're in these environments where there is a lack of proper bias training, when there is, we're subjected to countless microaggressions, negative passes at our race, we're not going to feel as open. We're going to feel discouraged from even coming to school. And when it's also just contributing to the fact that people don't want to have these hard conversations, that it doesn't matter how allied a teacher may seem, they still carry those biases. We still are subjected to these things and ignoring an issue and pretending like it's not a big deal just further adds into it. Yeah, and I think kind of adding on to the fact of just more diverse teachers and staff, um, I think it goes to the level of, you know, not just teachers, who are our guidance counselors, who are our administrators. Me personally, um, you know, I've been going to BCPS school since I was just in kindergarten, and I've never had a black teacher ever. Um, and I've only had like a handful of black teachers in the school buildings that I've been in. Um, and I've only ever had two black administrators, both wh whom were um, assistant principals. So, you know, if we don't, if we don't see these types of people and if we don't see people of color um, and, you know, and black staff members when, within our school buildings, what's, what message does that send to our students and what kind of, what kind of school climate um, does that really create? Because ultimately in order to have a successful school system and, and successful schools that are really preparing your students 
um, for the real world. We need environments in which students can learn, and they can only they can only do that if they're comfortable. Um, in terms of like, you know, like how can we be more courageous, like as a county, and like how can our leadership be more courageous? Going back to what Joshua said, I thought he brought up a really important point that there are a lot of people in our county, you know, who they have a lot of influence, they have a lot of like responsibilities, and they're very much in the public eye in that way. And I think that although it is sometimes intimidating and it is sometimes scary, that regardless of how you know, like experienced or how long these people have served our county, it's never, it should never be um, like a debate about whether or not someone out for being, you know, saying something that's racist or saying something that's prejudiced or anything like that. That's how like people can really show courage, you know, because when adults start to do that around you, kids and students, you know, start to think, you know, it is okay for me to call out other people as well because you know it's just leading by example really and when you see all these adults that you look up to teachers that you look up to who are saying to other teachers or to other administrators you know what you did wasn't okay students feel more inclined to and more comfortable in calling out their own friends or in calling out other people that they know and it just creates a culture that is much more um, like where there's much more accountability for what you say and what you do. And there has been a lot of, um, like, just in media recently, a lot of talk about, like, cancel culture. And I think that is, um, like, something that is, that should be discussed. It shouldn't be completely discounted. But about, like, it's more about teaching that person why what they said or what they did was wrong. And I think that when you see people take that courageous step and actually do that, it really reflects on our county and how we're growing as a group of people. So um, students, I would like to thank you and I honestly don't even want to cut this off, but we only have 10 minutes left. And so my wondering is if we could continue the conversation on our social media um, in terms of questions or any more dialogue that we want to put out there because I'm telling you, you all just took us and gave us the sermon that we needed to hear. Um, and so I want to offer a huge um, word of thanks. As a black mom, I am always um, cautious about how we protect our young people. Um, and you all are demonstrating so much courage and leadership. It just fills my heart in a whole different way. And so I, I truly need you to know how grateful I am personal local and immediate that you have chosen to share your thoughts, your perspectives, your experiences with us. Um, in the remaining few moments that we have left, I know we have um, other, we have another panel um, that we wanted to give a bit of time to, uh, for there to be some reaction to the things that the students have shared and they have given us so much. I have so many notes that I don't even know where to start in terms of recounting them, but what you should know is that I'll be organizing this information to make sure that we internally have record of your voice in this conversation. So with the, the time that we have um, remaining, what I wanna do is invite the remaining panel members. I know we have our board chairperson, Ms. Causey on the line. I know we have the principal from Milford Mill, Ms. Kiria Joseph on the line. Um, I know we have, um, Ms. Jose on the line, board member. Uh, certainly, we make space for Dr. Williams, our superintendent, for any section. And so with that, I'm going to invite reactions to the things that the students just shared. I'll go on mute. Um, Lisa? Yeah. And and before we hear from them, and, and the county executive is going to be joining us as well, um, we have a video that I think is a good transition from the student panel to the final panel, and it's it's from someone who has been uh, in the system a long time and and would would have been on this panel uh, otherwise. But um, let's let's show that video and and give uh, the students a chance to to mute themselves, and uh, then we'll open it back up to you and the panel. Okay, thanks. I have been through the minefields with our children, black children, white children, brown children, 
and children are beautiful and they all deserve to be able to come out of Baltimore County knowing that they have been given an equitable education and that they know how to live in a world together. I'm tired of hearing children in this century, okay, now here I am, in this century, still saying in 2020, I'm the only African American in my AP class, that the only way we get a, a proliferation of children of color in upper level classes is to have them in an AVID program. It should happen because they are gifted and bright. Because until our children of color are free, none of us will be. And so Lisa, I think now you can go ahead and open up the panel and have some discussions coming out of what the students have said and what Ms. Pasteur shared. Yeah, yeah. Um, thank you for, for not letting us miss that video um, because I will tell you that it makes me work really hard to be centered um, because it really is just that urgent that we figure out the work of being who we need to be for all of our young people. And so the passion in, an, in Ms. Pastor's voice and commitment to the organization um, is certainly not lost on me. And it is certainly not lost after having heard the voices of our students. So I wanna go back and make the offering that was advanced before um, the viewing. And that is, what did you find resonance with panel, uh, last and final panel? panel. Um, what did you find resonance with from the sharing of the students what did you find resonance with um, from the words of board member Pasteur? And what do you find resonance with as we wrap up this conversation around race and racism in the public school system? I'll go on. I can go first. Uh, thank you for oh, sorry thank you for, for this opportunity this is board member molly joes i think the students made a great point that we need to rethink our curriculum and make it more diverse and inclusive of everyone i heard that identity is important and i know one of the things as minorities we are often and still asked to assimilate and we know that leads to our identities being absorbed and making us invisible. It is a stark reminder to me that the dream that Dr. King so eloquently described in 1963 has yet to be realized. Um, as a school board member, we must do better, we have to do better, and we can do better. We cannot let politics or bias in our decisions, but our decisions should be based on equity and needs. Diversity, inclusion, and equity should not just be buzzwords we throw around, but we should adopt them as our core values in education. And yes, as a Baltimore County School Board member, I will state Black Lives Matter. Thank you. Hi, may I go next? Go for it. Okay. Um, my name is Kiria Joseph. I'm the principal of Milford Mill Academy. And um, I want to begin by thanking our students for their leadership and bringing us to a place where we have to be uh, comfortable um, to discuss and resolve our issues um, of systemic racism and racial bias within Baltimore County and our school system. And, and I must acknowledge that this is a vulnerable moment for me um, as a Black woman, um, as a Black principal, and a mother of two Black students in Baltimore County schools. And I'm also the president of the Baltimore County Alliance of Black School Educators. And so the vulnerability exists whenever Black people provide an insight on how racism negatively impacts. Uh, there's going to be criticism and sometimes some form of backlash. And so I want to note that the systemic racism did not begin uh, during the tenure of Dr. Williams. 
Um, he inherited a historic presence of racism that continues to run deep throughout the communities um, in Baltimore County. Um, and, and I want to give the perspective of just the racial bias kind of in our hiring, our staffing assignments, who is sitting at the table making the decisions. And when you look at our data, we have over 115,000 students, 64% are students of color, but there are 40% black students, but we only have 23.3% blacks represented in our workforce. I represent 18% of the only black principals represented for 175 schools. And sadly, we only have 3%, which is of six principals who are black males with only one black male in our elementary school. And so they're serving a population of about 22,720 black male students. My son who is entering his 12th grade has only had one black male teacher, one black male AP in his 12 year journey. And my daughter has never had a black male teacher, never had a black male AP in her journey. And so this should cause us to ask why? Black school leaders have instructional capacity. Uh, we are innovative, we are trailblazers in the, in the field of education. And it leads me to think, will white communities accept a black principal um, if that principal is placed in a school that is a white community? What are our actions to build the pipeline for black administrators, especially black male administrators? What are the support for aspiring black school leaders? And what are the supports uh, for black teachers? Um, and so I'm going to, I know we're short for time. Um, I'm going to stop there to allow the rest of the panel to respond. Dr. Williams, if I could speak. This is Kathleen Causey, and I am a board member. Um, and I just want to really appreciate and honor our students who have spoken so eloquently and so passionately about what they're experiencing. And I just want to say personally that I am dedicated to doing all that I can to fight racism where it does exist, tragically still, in our school system. And I am very grateful to the students and the staff and Dr. Williams and my colleague board members that are dedicated to engaging in this work. The Board of Education does have a key role in making sure that every student, each student, gets what they need to achieve their potential. And it is important that, as has been stated here, that we don't just talk the talk, but that we walk the walk. We take the time to be in these tough conversations. And I'm grateful that our board is committed to doing that. We had an equity lens workshop yesterday. We're gonna be doing implicit bias training, and we're gonna be having a board retreat to work with Dr. Williams on how we can build capacity to respond better to the needs of our students. So I just want to say that I appreciate that. I also, like Dr. Williams, took a lot of notes and there is a lot of work that we can do. And I am uh, grateful to be a part of, of the work that we can do together. And I do want to say also, I support Omar and I am, I, it was outstanding that one of his last uh, efforts for the school system as our SMOB, and we know his leadership continues now and it's going to continue, um, but was to bring that resolution to us where we did affirm as a board that all Black lives matter, our students' lives matter, and also our, our staff, and that it is um, vital that we focus on this work at this time. We have been working on it, but there is a lot more to do, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to be a part of it. Hey everybody, this is County Executive Johnny Olszewski. Uh, I wanna just very quickly say how proud I am of our students and our young people. Um, I've been listening in for the last hour or so, and it has been yet another reminder of how incredible uh, we have what, what incredible leaders we have in our student leaders. Um, and so Omar and Josh, thank you for your efforts here. Uh, thanks to both Dr. Williams. Dr. Williams is for coordinating. Um, you know, I, I think 
being short is just a reminder of how important it is that we leaders listen. And so I just want to reiterate how much I am listening in this moment um, as, the, as the elected leader for Baltimore County and knowing that um, how much work we have ahead of us, uh, whether it's our hiring or our curriculum, our promotion strategies, where we invest, what our policies are, uh, we are so committed to that work and listening is the best thing we can do coupled with that fear sense of, of urgency. So uh, I'm reminded that even as detractors would try to say that all lives matter, we have to keep pushing the, the truth that that will not be true unless we first say and acknowledge and make real that Black Lives Matter. So thank you again for the opportunity and uh, really appreciate all the leaders that have been on the call uh, and this, uh, this opportunity tonight. I have something to say. Oh uh, yeah. Um, so uh, Omar is not going to be able to make the uh, this panel, but luckily I'm here to fill in for him. And uh, my reaction to the last panel and uh, the video from Miss um, Pasture is just uh, sad. Um, it's a sad reality. Um, we keep uh, they keep uh, adults keep telling us that um, racism is not a thing. Um, that Jim Crow ended, segregation ended, that it's not a thing. But the reality, it, it, it really is. Just look at our curriculum, just look at our, the achievement gap, just look at um, the economic disparity all over. And um, and I'm not gonna continue uh, talking about what, well, it's just a sad reality. And like, I'm lost for words. And when people don't want to have these conversations or bring out straw man arguments saying that they're just looters, crazy people, protesters, that's how you're just angering the youth. And so I'm not going to uh, say anything else. I'm going to ask you, since we have all leadership here, are you going to take the courage? So I'm going to ask everybody to put on their mic now. Do you all believe that Black Lives Matter? Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. As I stated that. Are you going to listen to the youth voices? <laughs> yes. Absolutely. Yes. Are you going to yes. advocate for progressive changes? Yes. 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 And let me just tell you, the youth are going to hold you guys accountable. We cannot allow this history to continue. It has been prevalent in our society for 400 years. 400 years. And we need change to occur now. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you for holding us accountable. Thank you, Josh. I don't believe in putting commas where periods have been placed. So with that, I know that Dr. Williams is going to, um, or Mr. Dickerson will uh, wrap us up. So I will go on mute and thank you for the opportunity to host these panels. So let me just first say to Dr. Williams, Lisa Williams, um, I appreciate your leadership and the ability to moderate these conversations. Um, again, I have copious notes, but I would like to thank our esteemed panelists for your insights. Um, former staff, current staff, our students, our community leaders. And I also want to thank the audience and our students for uh, tuning in and asking questions. Let's take this opportunity to reflect on what we have discussed today. Um, you've heard a lot. Uh, we have a lot of work to do. Our goal today was to launch a series of conversations about racism and its effect on our students and schools. Uh, what we do next matters. Uh, first, keep reading and learning. Uh, you'll find plenty of resources for students and adults on our blog. Just check the social media or www.bcps.org. I also encourage our schools, or our school leaders, our staff, I encourage our schools to engage your students and staff in conversations about race. I encourage our offices to do the same with staff. As a school system, we will periodically come back together throughout this year. I'm gonna leave you with this quote. Change will not come if we wait for some other person or some other time. We are the ones we've been waiting for. We are the change that we seek, President Barack Obama. So thank you for joining us and have a great evening. I don't know if Mr. Dickerson wants to make a closing comment or not. You know, Doc, you said it all and I just wanna thank you for your leadership and allowing this to happen. 
uh, when we first brought you the idea, you were on board 100% and the students demanded. So thank you. And as you said, we will do this again very soon, both as a system, but we're also encouraging our school leaders to consider doing the same type of thing in your school communities. Your students are calling for it. Your parents are calling for it. And the time is now. Thank you. All right. Thank you all.